In this video, I'm going to be explaining excitation contraction coupling. So we're going to go all the way from the motor neuron down to the muscle cell and then down to the proteins actin and myosin. But before we can get into the details of the process, I just want to do a big overview. So during excitation contraction coupling, what happens is an action potential from the motor neuron arrives at the neuromuscular junction, and that's going to cause a series of events that creates a new action potential, which spreads down the muscle cell. So action potentials are electrical impulses, and the electrical impulse from the motor neuron creating a new electrical impulse in the muscle cell is the excitation. And once the muscle is excited, that action potential spreading down the muscle cell is going to trigger a release of calcium to the inside of the muscle cell. And that release of calcium is going to allow myosin to bind to actin, which will cause the muscle cell to contract. So even though you don't need to understand action potentials 100% of the way in order to understand how this process works, you do need to have some kind of a concept for the mechanics behind what is actually happening during an action potential for it to make sense. So we're going to start by just kind of reviewing the bare minimum about action potentials by looking at this one little section of a motor neuron a little bit more closely. So as I said, action potentials are electrical impulses. You may also hear them referred to as a wave of depolarization, and they spread along the cell membrane of nerve and muscle cells. And they are caused by a series of voltage-gated ion channels opening. So remember, an ion channel is just a doorway in a cell membrane that allows ions to pass through. And a gated channel is a doorway that is not always open but they're named for whatever opens them. So in this case, a voltage gated ion channel opens due to a change in the charge of the cell membrane. Or another way to say that is they open due to a change in membrane potential. So when there is a change in membrane potential, this voltage gated sodium channel is going to open and that is going to allow sodium to flow from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And because ions are charged particles, when the sodium flows across the membrane, it creates the change that opens up the next channel, which will open the next and the next. So basically, if you line up a bunch of voltage gated ion channels in a row, if you get one to open, the rest are all going to open like a bunch of dominoes falling over. And then I'll also mention, if you have already started learning about action potentials, you'll know that a series of potassium channels is going to open up right after this. And that's basically going to reset the membrane, which would allow the next action potential to come along. But for the purposes of this video, what we really want to focus on is that we've got these sodium channels opening up one right after the other because that's the part that's driving everything forward and creating the action potential that's going to spread all the way down to the neuromuscular junction. So at the neuromuscular junction, we have the very end of the motor neuron, which is called the axon terminal. On that axon terminal, there are voltage-gated calcium channels and then synaptic vesicles filled with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. On the other end of the neuromuscular junction, we have the motor end plate. That is just the part of the muscle cell membrane that the axon terminal is hovering over. On that motor end plate, we have ligand gated ion channels. So voltage gated ion channels open due to a change in the voltage of cell membrane. 
Ligand gated ion channels are a type of chemically gated channel that opens when a specific chemical binds to it. And then in between the axon terminal and the motor end plate, we have the synaptic cleft. That is just a space that is in between them. And in that synaptic cleft, there is an enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, that will come in at the very, very end of our story. So all along that muscle cell membrane, there's that series of voltage-gated sodium channels, but all the way at the end, at the axon terminal, we have this set of voltage-gated calcium channels. Once the action potential reaches that point, they will open and allow calcium to flood into the cell. That calcium flooding into the cell takes these synaptic vesicles and kind of pushes them so that they fuse with the cell membrane of the axon terminal. And then they spill their contents, the acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft. That acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft to bind with receptors on the ligand-gated ion channels, which is what opens them. Once they are open, they're going to allow sodium from the synaptic cleft to flow into the muscle cell and potassium to flow out of the muscle cell. Those charged particles flowing across the membrane causes a localized change in the voltage of the membrane that we call an end plate potential. So an action potential and an end plate potential are both caused by charged particles flowing across a cell membrane, but action potentials are caused by voltage-gated ion channels opening, and that's what allows them to spread. An end plate potential is caused by a ligand-gated ion channel opening, and it cannot spread. It is going to stay right here at the motor end plate. However, Right next to the motor end plate, there is a voltage-gated sodium channel, and the end plate potential creates the change in voltage, which opens up that voltage-gated sodium channel. And once we get that to open, we are going to create an action potential that spreads down the muscle cell membrane. So going back to that overview from the beginning, we have completed the first part. We had an action potential from the motor neuron that created a new action potential to spread down the cell membrane of the muscle cell. So we have excited the muscle cell. So now we have to see how does this cause calcium to be released? And how does that calcium being released allow myosin to bind to actin? So the muscle cell membrane, which you may also hear referred to as the sarcolemma, is a little bit different than other cell membranes because it does not stay just on the surface of the muscle cell. There are parts of it that dip down and cross through the muscle cell, and those are called T-tubules. There will be many of these in the muscle cells. I have just drawn one of them. And then very close to the T-tubules, you have the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is an organelle that's on the inside of the muscle cell and its job is to store calcium. So when that action potential spreads down the muscle cell membrane and reaches a T-tubule, it will spread down the T-tubule 
and now this is where we have to use our imaginations a little bit. On this T tubule, there are voltage sensitive proteins. Right next to them, on the inside of the muscle cell, on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are mechanically gated ion channels. So mechanically gated channels open when something physically touches them. And that action potential spreading down the T tubule causes those voltage sensitive proteins on the T tubule to change shape. And when they do, they kind of bump into the little mechanically gated ion channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which kind of pinches them, it squeezes them open. And that's what allows calcium to flood to the inside of the muscle cell. So my apologies if you had trouble picturing that. I will link a diagram um, in the description if that would help you. But for now, the most important takeaway is that action potential spreading down the T-tubule caused calcium to be released to the inside of the muscle cell. In the muscle cell, we have these organelles called myofibrils, which hopefully you remember are made of a series of repeating units called sarcomeres. And those sarcomeres are made of the contractile proteins, myosin and actin. So remember, myosin wants to bind to actin because on the actin, there are these active sites that these myosin heads are attracted to, they would like to be there. However, wrapping around the actin, we have this regulatory protein called tropomyosin that is blocking those active sites and preventing myosin from binding. Attached to that tropomyosin is another protein called troponin that has active sites for calcium. So when that calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it will end up attaching to the troponin. Once that calcium attaches to the troponin, that binding causes the troponin to change shape a little bit. And when it does so, it moves and it pulls tropomyosin away from those active sites. Once the active sites are available, that is going to allow the myosin to bind to the actin. And that is going to set off a process called the cross bridge cycle. So that is something that has its own steps that you're going to want to study separately from this. But just know it is a cycle of the myosin head attaches. And then once it attaches, it is going to ratchet, and that ratchet is going to pull the actin a little bit. Then it is going to detach, reattach to the next part, bend again, and that cycle is going to keep happening, and that repeated cycle is going to allow the actin to slide over the myosin which will make the entire sarcomere shorter. And because this is happening at every sarcomere in each myofibril, the whole muscle cell is going to get shorter and that's the contraction. So I'm going to put up all of these steps momentarily so that you can read through it one more time. But before I do that, I just want to cover how do we get this process to stop? Remember, in the beginning, I mentioned there's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that is in the synaptic cleft. Once the acetylcholine is released, 
that acetylcholinesterase is going to start immediately breaking down the acetylcholine. Then at the same time, on the membrane of the sarcopontic reticulum, there are calcium pumps that are actively trying to pump the calcium back inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So once there are no more action potentials coming down and causing us to release acetylcholine, the acetylcholine is going to get cleared from the cleft. So we're not going to have an end plate potential. So the action potential is going to be over. So we're not going to release any more calcium. And as the calcium levels fall on the inside of the cell, it will stop binding to troponin, which will cause the tropomyosin to once again cover the active sites and to prevent the myosin binding to the actin. All right, guys, I know that is quite, quite the process and, and it can feel really overwhelming, especially if you did not know a lot of this vocabulary ahead of time. So my advice to you would be check the description. I have a link to a playlist about all of this microanatomy type stuff that is kind of geared towards helping you build the vocabulary that will help you understand this topic. And of course, um, if there's anything that was unclear, feel free to ask me a question in the comments. Hope this was helpful. Have a great day and have fun learning.